Thank you. So I was reading the paper, and uh, there was a story. Uh, these kids, uh, eight and nine year old, were sniffing airplane glue to get high on. Now, these kids are responsible for turning musicians onto a lot of things they never knew about, actually. Lenny, for Christ's sake, I'm dying here. Yes, sitting in a cab must be harrowing. That looks scary and familiar. I have to appear in court. Oh, what's more fun than that? A late in life bris, that's more fun. <laughs> Bob B Y H R E. Try to say it. Bob B Y H R E. Bob B? <laughs> so boyish, you can't even say it. Bob B. If there was anything else in the entire world that I could possibly do to earn a living, I would. Anything. I'm talking dry cleaners to the clan, crippled kid portrait painter, slaughterhouse attendant. If someone said to me, Leonard, you can either read a guy's head or do two weeks at the Copa, I'd say pass the fucking salt. It's a terrible, terrible job. It should not exist. Like cancer. God. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Welcome to the latest, the greatest edition of Nick's Nonfiction. You're here with your host, Nick Muniz. This time around, we have got Lenny Bruce, How to Talk Dirty and Influence People. My life is like a Netflix comedy special. It's terrible. <laughs> Let me go light skin on you real quick. Hey, yo, I'm the next one. No cap. I'm the truth. All cap. I hate myself. No payoff on that joke. I said it because Lenny doesn't like a comedian up on a pedestal. Pedestal. Much criticism towards myself lends credibility towards my skepticism of others. He's not George Carlin pointing fingers. You need to fix the... Stop littering. It's annoying. Lenny Bruce makes fun of himself. I stuttered two sentences ago. Self-deprecation will save the nation. I've had about enough of everyone in their beliefs. How are you supposed to reach a consensus of laughter when there's no consensus of truth? I'm taking a round of applause. That wasn't funny, but it's true. It's a postmodern era, as academics call it. And what, what, I have to call a child baby rapist a minor attracted person. <laughs> Fucking reality is funnier than any joke will ever be ever again. We're going to talk all forms of the funny business. And uh, maybe make fun of people in the business as well. <laughs> Quote, How movies have ruined our lives. How everyone has to sell out to live. How every hipster, including myself, eventually goes out of date. Lenny was a beatnik in an era of hipsters. Yeah, man. Sit on that one. He said my divorce was an eight-year investment. That's not bad for an hour's worth of material. <laughs> this guy died of a heroin overdose. He married a hooker. You're not going to believe the book and the quotes we have? Listen to this one. What does a Jewish person do if someone's choking? Lachimlik maneuver. <laughs> To me, he says, if you live in New York or any other big city, you are Jewish. If you live in Butte, Montana, you're going to be goyish even if you are Jewish. <laughs> right. Before we jump in, what do we got? Bruce clearly wants the reader to be right there with him on the front lines, witnessing and enduring. Yeah, okay. Comedy is emotional abuse. You don't actually have to put up with shrapnel. Stop complaining. Quote, liberals can understand everything. That is, except for people who don't understand them. <laughs> Very comical. I'm going to try not to laugh at these, but it'll break me. Every day, people are straying away from the church and back to God. Guess that was funny back then. He just killed Nietzsche with that. We're on to Carl Jung. Last one. I hate small towns because once you've seen the cannon in the park, there's nothing else to do. <laughs> the fart cannon. We'll be right back after an ad. I love advertising because I love lying. <laughs> In advertising, everything is the way you wish it was. I don't care that it won't be like that when I actually get the product being advertised because in between seeing the commercial and owning the thing, I'm happy. <laughs> and that's all I want. Tell me how great the thing is going to be. I love it. I don't need to be happy all the time. I just want to enjoy the commercial. I want to get the thing. We know the product is going to stink. We know that. Because we live in the world and we know that everything stinks. 
we all believe, hey, maybe this one won't stink. We are a hopeful species. Stupid, but hopeful. About the author Lenny Bruce, check out Harry Schwann on Instagram. Nightly memes, topical, funny jokes, and I'd say the stories are even better. Patreon.com slash the niche. Check it out. This entire book is a biography. So let's hear some jokes of yours. Here's a knock em dead observation. This is what uh, women men comedy was like in the 50s. Guys are like dogs. They keep coming back. Ladies are like cats. Yell at them once and they're gone. You'll see his early career. He has to play by the books. And then he lets it rip talking about whorehouses later on. Quote, the role of a comedian is to make the audience laugh at a minimum once every 15 seconds. <laughs> yeah, I'm killing it over here. What do they say? It's supposed to be six laughs per minute now? Six laughs per second? Fuck that. It's a little bit harder now. And there's no truth. Here's another one. These days, it's not enough to boost that room full of strangers. A young cop... <laughs> A young co I said I wouldn't laugh. <laughs> a young comic spends all their time trying to sound different from the million other jokesters grabbing at the mic. Yeah, I can't go NPR because he actually talks like a beatnik. What is truth today? Maybe a damn lie next weekend. We got one more. What should be never did exist, but people keep trying to live up to it. Oh man, this reefer is so dank. There is no what should be. There is only what is. Whoa, man. We'll be right back. If anyone here is in advertising or marketing, kill yourself. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Right. It's a little thought. I'm just trying to plant seeds. Yeah, maybe. Maybe one day they'll take root. I don't know. You try. You do what you can. Lenny Bruce, How to Talk Dirty and Influence People, Chapter 1, Schlong Island. Quote, Filipinos come quick. Colored men are built abnormally large. Their wings look like a baby's arm with an apple in its fist. Ladies with short hair are lesbians. If you want to keep your man, rub alum on your pussy. How to get this published, 1950? What do heck? <laughs> Lenny learned how to talk dirty, he says. In the second paragraph, a fish and author, he learned from his mother's friend, who was a whore. Quote, she would begin in a pedantic fashion using academic medical terminology, but within ten minutes she would begin spouting her hoary hornyisms. Let it rip. Why do Asian girls smell like cucumbers? Remove the filters. I, I, uh, no, I'm playing by YouTube's rules. Quote, at this tender age, I knew nothing of douches. The only difference between men and women was that women only had headaches and didn't like whistling or cap guns, and men didn't like women, that is, women they were married to. <laughs> it's pretty good. He was, <laughs> he's a prodigy. <laughs> His aunt sold portable bidets. People's buttholes were cleaner in the 30s. Quote, in 1932, you really heard that word a lot business but it wasn't i wonder what happened to the business everyone knew what happened to the business there wasn't any that dumb bastard president hoover was blamed for driving us into the depression by people who didn't necessarily have interests in politics but just liked saying that dumb bastard president hoover <laughs> lenny's making observations young it sounds like he spent his childhood playing under the porch i thought that was funny and he would hide money under there he saved up like 13 bucks. <laughs> Probably could have bought you a car back then. Quote, Mr. Swan gave me the first book I ever bred. R bred. Richard Halliburton's Royal Road to Romance. The tale of world travelers who continually search for inner peace. Okay, kind of deep shit. He should be reading the back of cereal boxes. That's what I was up to when I was 12. He got some pretty hard-fought wisdom from his grandma here. I like this quote. Negroes are all Jews. Italians are all Jews. Irish men who have rejected their religion are Jews. Mouths are very Jewish and bosoms. Okay, a lifetime worth of wisdom from this grandma. Mouths are Jewish. It's very humid in here. There's broccoli stuck on the top, Caden. That was not racist. <laughs> 
He says, uh, yeah, stereotypes have nuance. I think racism is for smart people. It's not all fucking black and white. I'm telling you, Latinas' hips are statistically improbably large. Quote, celebrate is a Goyish word. Observe is a Jewish word. The difference between Jewish and Goyish girls is that Gentile girls won't touch it once, whereas a Jewish girl will kiss you and let you touch it. Your own, that is. <laughs> the biggest conundrum I think I found in this book from Lenny's youth was when he learned how to beat the bishop. His father moved back home at, like, the worst time in his childhood. Quote, I would have to stop. No tapering off. I would have to stop now. In the language of the addicts, I would have to kick the habit. Cold jerky. <laughs> That's perfect writing. He says he's, like, wanking to pictures on TV. I credit the motion picture industry as the strongest environmental factor in the molding of children of our day. <laughs> Okay, Marshall McLuhan. Lenny made a forever friend at North Long Island High School. Long Island. This guy's name was Carmelo. Quote, Carmelo's father had a barber shop with one chair and poster in the window showing four different styles of haircuts. North Korea. And guaranteeing you surefire results in securing employment. The first thing that employers look for is hair, nails, and shoes. This, <laughs> I was going to skip this quote. Hold on. An atomic energy department head who looks at these qualifications in a job application would probably be a f*** it. <laughs> and yeah, I have to bleep that. Very fun. Having his own father home, Lenny was saying, like, I'm learning shit they don't teach you at school. My father instilled in me a few important behavioral patterns, one of which was a fantastic dread of being in debt. Now that $13 under the porch is going to come in handy mid to late chapter at 16 i ran away from home and found it two rich productive sweet years with the dangler family on the schlong island farms a couple of german swedish immigrants i would wait for an opportunity when mr dangler was enjoying a good laugh and then i would catch him unaware and give him a big hug why are you going soft on us len mrs dangler called us a kissing bug <laughs> i'm cringing at the sweetness they grew carrots potatoes lettuce he knew his fruit. Those are vegetables. He goes deep again on marketing and how it's like cutting out middle America. Bro, I have a theory. Middle Canada and middle America are going to unite and make the super bread basket. Last quote for the chapter. Mrs. Dengler drove me to the station of the Schlong Island Railroad to catch the train that would take me away to war. I kissed her and said goodbye, Ma. She smiled back at me and left. <laughs> Chapter 2, The War. Started with a quote. I volunteered for the Navy in 1942. I was 5'2". I weighed 120 pounds. The Navy taught me a sterile sense of cleanliness. For the first time, I was able to relate to my fellow man. Mm -hmm. He grew up in like Italian and Japanese neighborhoods. He's going to have to go kill those people now. <laughs> now there are no more dirty Japs. There are dirty commies. And then when we run out of them, there will just be dirty dirt and dirty mud. <laughs> it's the wokesters. It's the Trumpsters. Then we'll eat the mud and Pearl Buck will write a book about it. That's our Malcolm Gladwell. By that time, the few hippies who discovered that the earth, which is dirty, will have been made it to the moon and the missile contest. I don't know what that is. Yeah, hippies are going to be astral projecting while you guys are lobbing bombs at each other. Quote, seeing those pitiful, fresh, dead bodies, I knew that what mockery of life was, a material concept of what war is. He saw dead bodies. Yeah. Here's a really big quote. As a child, I loved confusion. A freezing blizzard that would stop all traffic. Toilets that would get stopped up and overflow and run down the halls. Electrical failures. Anything that would stop the flow and make it back up and find new direction. This guy loves chaos. Confusion was entertainment for me. While the war was on, the alternation of routine confusion sustained my interest, but then it was over and I wanted out. That's why earthquakes are confusing. We don't know where the fault lies. You thought I was rambling. Yeah, the first place he goes when he goes home, goes squared, is to the Dengler family. Quote, you put on some weight, Mrs. Dengler said. Are you going to be around? Probably. 
See you later. And they drove off, leaving me staring in the dust. The one family he thought he had. It was really a business transaction. Now he has to go back and live with the whores. Quote, I knew then that this was all it had ever been, a job. Tom Wolfe was right when he said you can't go home again, but it's especially true when it's never your home to begin with. Still, you don't completely dissolve the fantasy. That was super sad. Gets interesting now. He gets into the show business. There was a guy named Joe Clooney. He rented out a spot on Main Street in their part of Long Island, and Lenny's mother used to go and perform at Lego Mania. She would go and build Legos <laughs> while Fred Armistands, what's that competition on Fox? She would also perform on the Rubber Legs Night. It was a burlesque show. Quote, the owner asked my mother to MC. She was petrified. She had never spoken a single line on a stage before. Moreover, audiences were not used to seeing a woman MC. I had seen the master ceremonies a lot of times, so I asked my mother if I could do it. What was so hard about that? Say, how about a nice hand for the so-and-so, folks? And with a quick meeting with the boss and the lawn supply demand, I was given my entree into show business. It's kind of funny, but it's annoying. He's dripping with virgin open micer confidence. Listen to this fucking quote. <laughs> I was really dap with my sharp brown suede shoes, A.S. Beck, one button roll suit from Buddy Lee's. It was bar mitzvah blue. I had a Billy Eckstein collar, a black knit tie, and a five point hanky. He said handkerchief. Hanky's funnier. Should I wear my discharge button? No, I'll make it on talent alone. Talent alone, sure. Right place, right time. Talent is hitting a target that no one else can hit. Genius is hitting a target no one else can see. Could take that one home as well. Dropping knowledge out here. Yeah, he's uh, fucking annoying. Same, I saw a strange, silver, rather grotesque-looking ball in front of my nose. It was a microphone. I was on stage. G good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Bring out the broads! Someone cut him off his first sentence. Oh my god, a heckler. The angry request came from one of the two guys standing near the bar. He froze and shout back to them, I'd like to, but then you wouldn't have any company at the bar. <laughs> he uh, got his first laugh. Quote, it was like the flash that I have never had morphine addicts describe. A warm, sensual blanket that comes after a cold, sick rejection. An addict in his rightful habitat, Lenny Bruce, is on the comedy battlefield. Chapter 3, The Trenches. <laughs> At the time, Lenny said there were 15 clubs who would put up amateurs on slow nights. He made the rounds for agents in Manhattan. Buddy Fryer connected him with someone. Quote, the prizes were 150 and 25 bucks. We amateurs would sit around the club and called for volunteers when get up. Yes, yeah, so they would volunteer. You have to pay to get on stage in today's world. Stop complaining. He said I was going to start working double shifts. Fucking do it, brother. You won't. Lenny is up there giving his soul, and he's saying, I never won a round of applause from the audience. He's trying to make points. <laughs> Stop it. Talk about sex. Quote, the winner was selected by holding a hand over their head. Uh, the sweet potato usually won. He had a limp and wore a double-sized ruptured duck he had especially made for himself. You could see it from anywhere in the house. This gave me the idea for the first bit of material I ever did that caused controversy. Yo, that's the word of the day. I got fucking park rangers emailing me. What we've seen on your YouTube page is very unacceptable. Okay, what's your point? You have to catch me in the act. This isn't fucking Requiem for a Dream, that Tom Cruise movie where you could go and get people for post-crime. What the hell is this? Get off your ass and onto the mountain. Retro act minority report. There it is, so that doesn't make me sound any less crazy. I don't give a fuck. Controversy is the only way to, on stage, you build up the tension and then make everyone feel like they're right. <laughs> He's saying, as a political president, whatever, I don't care about Hoover. This was when Lenny Bruce um, wore onto stage his ribbons and he would go, yo, I stole these from a hobo in the alley. They're fake valor. 
and then some people would just laugh and some people <laughs> I fought in World War II he said it was the first time I felt real hostility from an audience and they'd missed to the point yeah, nobody gives a fuck about your edgy the ribbons man just talk about blow jobs Lenny's learning like the only thing people care about is their own image if you approach the joke right I stole this off another guy stealing valor now you're the good guy and everyone laughs again that's my fucking master class in comedy. Quote, after four or five months on these amateur gigs, I wrote a little act for myself, which eventually refined into this Hitler bit, wherein the dictator was discovered and handled by MCA. And I did all the standard impressions, Cagney, Laurie, Bogart, in Double Talk, German. Very nice. That's great. He's putting a spin on the classics. Within a few months, I became a hot I was making $450 a week working everything good. The Strand, the Broadway, the TikTok in Milwaukee. So by 1951, he's on the road. Anybody can get away with dirty toilet jokes. It takes talent to get laughs with clean stuff. Is that true, Lenny? He says uh, the Korean War was dying down. Quote, as the impact lessened, so did the desire to escape lessen. And all the escape hatches, the bars, nightclubs, theaters. They had a little pandemic. No one's going out to the clubs. Lenny well, also said that Jack Parr generation was getting easy laughs off of double entendres. And he's saying he's got the real talent by making clean jokes. <laughs> I, I'm not putting myself in any of these things. I know I sound contradictory. I'm gay. Quote, during this post-war period, I was afraid. I didn't have it as a comedian. I had the mental facility, but I didn't have the psychology capacity. Psychology capacity to accept rejection like I said it's just emotional abuse over and over and over it's mental fortitude so that's why every guy in your office that says I could be a comedian you can't sit in a plane with a fat fucking smelly guy next to you or drive to Wyoming <laughs> uh, quote this is a warped concept I realize we Americans have a negative attitude toward prostitution this is not shared by foreign people He's starting to talk about what he actually cares about on stage, prostitutes. Even the word French brothel sounds exotic, nearly romantic, compared to cat house. And they are more romantic. They cater, I'm in slow motion, they cater to the imagination and the spirit as well as the body. Here, it's distinguishedly cut and dried. So, like, we're making fun of Lenny Bruce for not being edgy enough in the 50s. Women are like cats and men are like dogs. This guy was going to whorehouses. I don't have any material on that because we're prude as fuck. This guy was actually living it up. He says, yeah, I was not able to talk about what I wanted to on stage. This guy's a bored heroin addict dating prostitutes, and he's trying to keep it clean. <laughs> like, the life of a comedian is hell. Your work should reflect your life. He's um, going to explode at some point. Let's go to chapter four. <laughs> the truth. Lenny performed in Pittsburgh a lot. The accommodations were subpar. Quote, there was no toilet in the room. It was at the end of the hall, but there was a sink in the room. Needless to say, I didn't wash my face in the sink. Truth of the matter. He's living on the road. He's doing a lot more heroin. He fucking got his black convertible stolen. It was a Cadillac in Pittsburgh. He owed like $12,000 on it. He's in debt. Remember that quote from the beginning? My father instilled a hard fear. The heroin is OP. <laughs> this is 1954. He's saying I'm on a tight budget. Wait, there's no $100 million Spotify deal? <laughs> Got a quote here. Living from one crazy disaster to another, Honey and I were always laughing. This is the main chick he rides with. He marries her. Kidding, teasing, loving each other, nothing could really hurt us because we picked each other up. I was like that kid in Peanuts with his dopey blanket. I can't give him the laugh. Do not make fun of Linus. Lenny. <laughs> Lenny, he's got in a car accident. <laughs> Very funny. He said he was fine, but he was thrown through the windshield and cracked his head on the curb. That's the Kinnison story, baby. He was a preacher, then he got hit by a car and literally became cracked. <sighs> I think uh, fucking the industry got behind Seinfeld and discourse to the Kinnison movement. That didn't make sense. I'll try to tie it in later, though. 
Uh, this guy's bing chilling, doing a lot of heroin on the road. Quote, the only hang up now, I wonder, is if God is a man or a woman, or what color he is, since the Bible could not be read if it were only for printing and the Chinese people were smart enough to invert the printing. I don't know, but it was racist and it sounded funny. <laughs> Boom a Huma. God must be yellow. What would his son's name be? Wong Jesus. <laughs> that was Lenny. <laughs> Quote, <clears throat> at this time I was working a burlesque club and there was a TV producer from the show Your Mystery Misses who was a burlesque uh, regular customer. It's a funny scene. He's going to keep talking like he's from the 50s because he is. This guy would always say, you know, I come to the club to see the comedians. And this was the perfect cover because everybody is actually there to see some legs. <laughs> and... I think this is probably just what comedians should start doing, going up at strip clubs. It won't happen. Strip club music is way too good now. What do we got here? The TV producer. Yeah, this guy got him into show business even more than Buddy Hackett could before. Lenny starts getting single TV roles on that uh, Your Mystery Misses, a game show. And yeah, he's hooking up behind Honey's back. The Truth here, that was the name of the chapter. Lenny doesn't know who to thank for this next leg of his career. He said, either God, or maybe the car crash, or maybe the old adage, you can't keep a good crook down. <laughs> chapter 5, The Screenwriter. We'll pick up pace. What is this, a half hour show today? Times are getting hard again. The Honeymooners, get it, her name is Honey. They return to their vices to keep afloat. Heroin. Honey's taking up some offers at, like, road clubs to strip. Stress is piling up, and the couple goes through this cycle of breakup, get back together. It's eight years, and then they finally divorce. 1957, Lenny's saying something has to change. Why is divorce so expensive? Because it's worth it. <laughs> Quote, how can I ever marry again? I'd have to say the same things to another woman that I had to say to Honey, and I couldn't say the same things to another woman. What, are you going soft on us, Lenny? Burn some more tar in your spoon. Quote, Hugh Hefner heard about me, and he came to San Francisco to hear me. He arranged for me to come to Chicago and work at the Closetier. They offered me $600. Sets went well. But sets... Quote, I had gotten a job as a writer at 20th Century Fox. They were working on a motion picture called The Rocket Man. Buddy Hackett told them Lenny's very good. He's funny. He could create everything. Why don't you let him have a crack at it? The average writers can do like 15 pages in a weekend. First Lenny, first weekend, the Lenny cranked out 150. What are you doing this, Lenny, <laughs> this weekend? Uh, quote, in December of 1962, I was arrested at the Gate of Horn in Chicago for obscenity. <laughs> We're going fast. This is another kind of turn in his career. He was content with writing, and so then he gets more risky on stage. In December 1962, I was arrested at the Gates of Horny in Chicago for obscenity. But according to Variety, the prosecutor is at least equally concerned with Bruce's indictment or organized religion as he was more... That's word soup. Lenny is making a splash in the Writers Guild, and the tabloids are trying to smear him. He's still playing both sides of the ball. He used this joke. I changed my last name to Bruce from Schneider because I didn't want to work in Hollywood. <laughs> making fun of Jews. That's not going to help your Hollywood career. <laughs> oh, no. The reason Lenny got more physical, he said at the end of his career, was because a popular British comic named Mr. Guinness was getting as big as Charlie Chaplin. Bro, at a certain fucking point, how funny are you? Get with the energy, act something out. For real, it's how much wordplay can we handle? <laughs> and so he starts style mogging the Brits. Big up. <laughs> He's saying Henny Youngman and Joey Lewis are still my favorite Americans. Uh, 1961, Lenny got arrested in San Francisco. All for one word. It's a ten-letter word. It's a homosexual practice. Why did he explain it like that? Cocksucker. You could call a woman a cocksucker. You're not allowed to say that on stage. Even though, you know, my foul... 
I shoot with a pump action shotgun. It's a cock smoker. He got taken to court, apparently. Um, Lenny made the jury laugh. He said, fuck, I kind of just blew the bit with my gay logic. He said, there's nothing wrong with the word cock. It means chicken. There's nothing wrong with the word sucker. Ain't that right? <laughs> the jury laughed that hard. Yeah, <laughs> he still had to pay a fine. Back in Hollywood, he meets Jackie Gleason. Start writing together. He gets more road gigs, gets more money, does more drugs. Quote, TV is just advertising for your live gigs, so I'm playing whichever show is going to get me the biggest crowd. This is the modern model. Go on the fucking podcast circuit. <laughs> it's dying. And then uh, you get to do live shows. Quote, a performance cannot be considered utterly without redeeming social importance if it has literally artistic or aesthetic merit. Okay, fucking poetry. I see my shadows coming out because it's the comedy edition. <laughs> Shadow the Hedgehog, Chapter 6, The Addict. To begin the end, quote, Marijuana will be legal someday, because the many law students who now smoke pot will someday become the congressmen and legalize it in order to protect themselves. You're wrong, Lenny. They smoke it behind doors. Come on, Harris. <laughs> I won't do it. But, uh, yeah, Lenny had a good point about this. Pot in America is... The I know you know, but we'll both make believe we're asleep game. <laughs> Very funny. You're trying to get a blowy and you both are awake, but you can't say cocksucker. Quote, by the way, my cellmate, what happened to you? Oh, shit. <laughs> I needed to preface this. It's pretty dope. Lenny was in jail a bunch and he's starting to learn that convicts are the funniest people on earth. Quote, by the way, my cellmate, what happened to you? How did you come to murder three guys in a crap game? You've got blood on your hands. How did you first get obsessed with this terrible disease of gambling? Where did it start? I would have asked about the murder. Oh, I started gambling with bingo at the Catholic Church. <laughs> Don't tell me the temple of God is procuring vice. Lenny knew something was up with his overall health. He said uh, the Red Hill Inn in New Jersey was a 600-seater. His body was overtaken by uncontrollable shakes. And so he actually made a joke about it. A true comedy veteran. J -j 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 Jesus, it's f f f f f freezing in here. He's having a seizure. And a couple of the stagehands dragged him backstage. He went to the hospital with a 103-degree fever. Lost out on a $1,800 gig. And he was already in the hole. He said this needed to meet his heroin habit. Not good. More stress for what they said was caused by stress. Lenny starts suspecting at the venue, the Gate of Horn, another time in San Francisco, that he's being set up. He said the club manager was tight with the police. He said it in a beatnik way. But three quarters of the way through the show, he gets arrested. This is like the 58th minute of your set. They take you off for profanity. And then... You don't get paid because you caused a ruckus, but the police get their fucking fines and the club owner gets an entire show. No refunds. <laughs> yeah, Lenny's like, I'm being scammed. He's being demonetized. <laughs> Quote, our original opinion recognized defendants' rights to satirize society's attributes for contemporary social problems. I'm not going to read this. He literally is a lawyer at the end of his career. As the method used in doing so is not so objectionable as to render the entire performance obscene, your honor objection! My only challenge was to tell the truth, man. Figure out what I had to say. <laughs> Here comes a fart, motherfuckers. Okay, so Lenny Bruce... Oh my god, it reeks! Fuck! Fuck me, I'm lightheaded now. I'm huffing farts. Lenny Bruce had a priest that he was close with. Yo, I didn't know that priests go to comedy clubs. It smells. Quote, clearly your intent is not to excite sexual feelings or to demean, but to shock us awake to the realities of racial hatred and invested absurdities about sex, birth, and death. To move towards sanity and compassion. I think the priest... <laughs> He's a much better judge of 
innocence than that jury was before. He's like, even though you say bad words, your intent is good. And he's getting real honest towards the end. Lenny is going, I'm not going to try to get clean. My act is a hellscape because that's what my life is. He's going, I'm not trying to get clean. Like, my life is hell, what I said before. So why am I going to act like it's not? Why even be a comedian if you are going to get clean? Didn't you get into the whole thing to be a piece of shit degenerate? <laughs> not saying that's good. It's definitely funny. I don't, yeah, don't trust a motherfucker who doesn't talk about what they want to. Quote, I suppose that if I were Christ-like, I would turn the other cheek and keep letting you punch me out and even kill me because what the hell? I'm God's son. It's not even bad dying when you know you've got a past to come back indefinitely. All right, shut up, New Age Lenny. It's a triple rim shot with an organic fart in there. Lenny Bruce, he's obviously Jewish, he's saying, Well, why should I actually do things that hurt if it's just going to be the same thing? Because you're a soldier of Christ. <laughs> yeah, this is why he does morphine. I guess he doesn't believe in punishment. You will pay for your sins, Leonard. Yo, he was saying earlier in the book that he would cut lawns for $6 just to meet his habits. Like, well, you <laughs> step right up, $5 a pop, have Lenny Bruce mow your lawn. This is a wild time in history. Quote, of all the comedians I've ever met, Steve Allen is not only the most literal, but the most moral. He not only talks about society's problems, he does things about them. He's a good person without being all sugar and showbiz. I really dig that from him. A real comics comic, you know. I have a theory that Tim Allen is the clean Joe Rogan. If you listen to their bits... It's both about guys being chimpanzees. <laughs> Sorry. Quote, if I was a public attorney, I could get Ray Charles a driving license. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, Philadelphia was a war zone for him. <laughs> Headline, Comic Bruce Shakedown in Narcotics Case. Like all of the cops know that he has a bunch of money. He's actually pushing weight too. I never mentioned that on the road. So they're just finding ways to bust him on stage. He's being torn down by the media. He's nega Seinfeld. So yeah, it's not the Larry David writing. It's the same fucking story for nine seasons. I wonder if this time Larry's going to have to pay for what he did wrong. I thought you were Jewish. <laughs> August 3rd, 1966, Lenny Bruce was found dead in the bathroom of his Hollywood Hills home. If you've ever seen the photo, he's lying face down naked on the floor with a syringe in his hand. There's a burned bottle cap next to him. <laughs> Very funny. He died a beatnik in a decade of hippies. He outlived his time, but that's basically every comedian. You're looking at fucking time capsules. Oof. <laughs> And it's even happening to, like, Logan Paul and all these influencers, too. The shelf life for everything is negative. Provide people with value. Quote, he was, in a sense, an evangelist. So this was the reverend now at his funeral. Reverend on a street corner. He was a man uptight against an artificial world who shattered its facades and its hypocrisies. And if you will pardon the phrase, which seems to be cliche, he saw life as it is. It's fucking touching, yo. Yeah, the soapboxes get bigger over time, so you get harassed a lot more by park rangers. <laughs> I want to end it all there, but he's got one more fucking hefty quote. Uh, I've been influenced by my father telling me that I would become crooked because of my maniacal masturbation by reading Glorowski Zero, by listening to Uncle Don and Clifford Brown, by smelling the burnt powder at Anzio in Salerno. I've been influenced from torchings by my ex-wife, giving money to Moondog as he played the upturned pails around the corner from 51st and Broadway, hearing stories about a pill they can put in the gas tank with water, but the big companies won't let it out, the same big companies that have the tire that lasts forever. I'm telling you, American-Canadian breadbasket! Even these, like, whack job theories he said contributed to how he thinks. Yeah, marijuana could be legal, but the big liquor companies won't let it happen. 
I've been influenced by colored people and their special odor. I've been influenced by the thought that James Dean is really alive in a sanatorium, and Hitler is waiting to book me for six weeks in Argentina. <laughs> I am influenced by every second of my waking hour. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, living like Lenny. <laughs> That it is How to Talk Dirty by Lenny Bruce. Thank you guys for staying tuned. Because we need a little controversy. Hell yeah, let's fucking raise some more hell for the remainder of the summer. One week at a time. Next week, what do we got? The Big Book of Pain. This will be a fun one. We're literally going through all of the worst torture devices from around the world from history. <laughs> Maybe we'll talk about who we want to see put in these and why. Guys, thank you for staying tuned. Um, yeah, four years into my comedy journey. Don't stop pepeeving. I'm going to have to like super commit at some point if that's the thing, but uh, making movies is super fun. So make sure you check it out. Patreon.com slash the niche. Harry Schwann on Instagram for your free nightly memes. We get a random soundboard effect to take us home. Bomb has been diffused. You thought I was going to bomb. Only home runs here. Standards. I'll see you all in seven short days. Nick Muniz signing off. Love you all. Peace.